Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Matt Zaglin, Scott Hepburn, and Bjorn Andre. Coming up on DTNS, David Spark is here to tell us the security trends coming out of the RSA conference, plus the Insteon smart home server mystery, and how much you should worry about the Apple M1 chip vulnerability. DTNS starts now! This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, June 10th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. And, and joining us, co-host, David. <laughs> yes, David, I'm sorry, I almost left you to introduce yourself. Co-host and producer at the CISO series, David Spark. Uh, welcome back. It's good to have you back, man. I'm, I'm hey, thrilled to be back. Let's start right in with a few tech things you should know. Netflix announced several new game titles that are tied into its TV shows. For example, the Queen's Gambit chess game is, as you might assume, a chess game coming sometime <laughs> later this year. Shadow and Bone Destinies is a single-player RPG set in the world of the show Too Hot to Handle. <laughs> if you're not familiar, it's designed to mimic the reality show where singles are on an island competing for shockingly very little money. And Casa de Papel is a heist game. There are also several other games not directly tied to Netflix franchises. All right. Uh, that's what I thought they'd be doing right from the beginning, but interesting. Truckers in South Korea increased a strike action on Friday. This is a story worth keeping an eye on because it could reduce delivery of material needed for semiconductor manufacturing. Container traffic at the port of Busan was down by a third. Uh, to uh, was down by a third. Uh, port uh, activity at Incheon was down to twenty percent. And uh, port activity at Ilsan uh, was suspended as of Tuesday. It also has cut Hyundai's factory production by half and affected steelmaker Posco. The truckers are protesting the effect of rising fuel costs. And President Yoon suk Yul is taking a neutral stance, which means an agreement may take longer. And if this drags out, that's going to affect the supply chain. If you might recall, Seth Green, the actor uh, and producer, built a TV show around a Bored Ape NFT that he owned. Bored Ape NFTs carry intellectual property rights with them, unlike many other NFTs, but that's what they do. You also might recall that his Bored Ape was stolen and then sold to somebody who went by the alias Darkwing84 and Mr. Cheese. <laughs> well, we've got some good news. Board Ape 8398, a.k.a. Fred Simeon, has been transferred back to Seth Green as of Tuesday. Our long global nightmare is over, everybody. A wallet controlled by Green transferred 165 Ether to a wallet controlled by Mr. Cheese. So it looks like Mr. Green paid about 100000 more than Mr. Cheese had paid for it. So uh, that's where you... That's that's where we land on this one. I love that the green and cheese and a story about money. Uh, at its financial analyst day, AMD announced that Zen 4 CPUs will arrive later this year, offering 8 to 10% faster instructions per clock than Zen 3. Single-threaded performance gains greater than 15% and more than 25% improved performance per watt. company will also introduce Zen 5 in 2024 with all-new microarchitecture and integrating AI and ML optimizations. On the graphics side, AMD said its RDNA 3 GPU architecture will be built on a 5-nanometer process and offer at least 50% improved performance per watt and be built on a chiplet design for efficient scaling. Two government regulatory stories worth keeping track of today. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority plans to launch an investigation into Apple and Google's market power in mobile browsers, as well as into Apple's cloud gaming restrictions. The CMA also launched a separate investigation into the Google Play billing requirements in the Play Store. And the U.S. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration posted documents saying it's upgraded its investigation into incidents with Tesla's autopilot to an engineering analysis. That's its second and final phase before it could determine a recall. Mm, could get a recall there. That's worth keeping an eye on, too. All right. Uh, let's talk about Insteon. Uh, back around April 16th, Smart Labs apparently shut down the company just shut down and Insteon's smart home servers went down with it because Smart Labs owns Insteon. Now, Insteon light switches, outlets, and sensors all still worked over RF, but users couldn't access their hub remotely 
uh, and cloud integrations with Google and Amazon stopped working because they relied on those servers. A few days after that shutdown, Smart Labs said it had failed in attempts to sell Insteon and had therefore handed over the intellectual property to a third party for sale. That's all we heard until this week. Tuesday, Stacy on IoT, Stacy Higginbotham's uh, newsletter, reported that some of her users, as well as folks on a Reddit thread, reported that their hub just started working again. No warning, which, I mean, that's a good thing, but nobody told them it was going to happen. It just happened. It seemed that Insteon servers had come back on. Sarah, we had a mystery. We did. Uh, so the mystery cleared a little bit on Thursday when somebody named Ken Fairbanks, that CEO of Insteon Technologies, posted that a small group of passionate Insteon users have uh, that have successfully inquired Insteon. Okay, so they explained that their first priority was getting the servers back online, and then they did that before they had access to the Insteon website or email or social accounts. Hence, the lack of communication. Mm. It was a con clandestine move that makes sense but it'd be interesting to find out how fairbanks's group was able to purchase the company when others could not stacy higginbotham as you mentioned tom reported that universal devices ceo mike Conanim said in a said in june that his company which makes a popular hub that works with the insteon system made a bid but was rebuffed all right but i've got a clue on why fairbanks may have succeeded uh where michael Conanim didn't uh in his LinkedIn profile, he has a history of business development and investing, as you might expect somebody leaving an leading an investor group that bought Insteon. But it includes a stint with Smart Labs as VP and general manager from 2004 to 2007, where he was, quote, responsible for the development, marketing and business development of the Insteon home control networking technology and products. Uh, so he kind of helped bring Insteon about in the early days. Obviously, uh -huh. he says he's part of a passionate group that wants to restore it, and he's got a stake in that, but he probably had some connections that he could pull to get this deal to happen. And good, too, right? Because Insteon <laughs> users get their service restored. However, I don't know, David, d does this give you uh, confidence that, you know, if you buy yeah, smart like, home material? Like too too much is, hot potato here, or is it, well, it is just hot, kind of, you know, business well, this, as usual? You know, the, this was the... the thing with uh, all these smart home uh, networks, whether, you know, you had to choose one, whether Zigbee was one and mm -hmm. was a direct competitor to Zigbee. I'm trying to remember. Z-Wave. Z-Wave. Thank you. And they were, I remember at CES, this goes back a number of years, the two of them were kind of fighting tooth and nail and their their booths were like right next to each other. And it was all of like, you got to choose one environment or another. And, it, and you know, it's of the, you know, the beta VHS days too. pick a, pick a team and hope you want, you pick the right one. Um, the Insteon people picked the wrong one, but luckily, uh, not all is lost. Yeah, I, and and even when matter comes, which I'm, I'm cheering for, yeah, it. I mean, it's going to come. Yeah, it's going to come. Hold your breath later this but, year. No, it's going to yeah, come, Sarah. Come I believe in it. Uh, when matter <laughs> comes, it'll it'll end that war. It'll end that HD DVD Blu-ray war uh, for for that part of the the battle. But something like this could still happen because even if you're using matter, you still might have servers that are providing at least integration with cloud, right? Uh, in which case, if you're a smaller company and your servers go away, you could have this kind of disruption. So it it, it is a weakness in the system if you've got cloud-based service for stuff, which Quick you kind of have to have. You. Have you ever had a service that you love that got shut down because the business shut down and you were really bummed? That's a good question. I don't I'm sure I, I have. I've had services uh, that I canceled and then later they shut down and I was glad that I wasn't. Well, no, you, I was you no were essentially a setting a trend. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if I ever had something go away while I was. Oh, you know what? Google Reader. That's the closest mm. I can think of. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. I guess that would apply to me as well. And, and many other Google services. But that was one I was relying on <laughs> uh, quite a bit uh, for, for my daily my daily driver. All right, well, let's talk some chips, shall we? Apple's M1 chips, like some ARM chips, implement something called PAC or PAC, which stands for Pointer Authentication Code. PAC checks are used to protect the CPU against attackers with memory access. PAC was introduced in ARM 8.3. It adds a cryptographic signature to pointers in memory. So if an attacker tries to replace the pointer, like with a buffer flow attack, for example, it won't have that signature and will be rejected and the attack will fail, or it should fail if all things go well. 
It's a last line of defense, though. If an attack has succeeded against the operating system and is compromising memory pointers to execute its attack, Pat can still stop it unless you do this attack method that folks at MIT discovered. Tom, I know you looked into this a bit. Yeah, yeah. This is this is both very interesting, uh, bad for people in certain situations, but for most of us, a curiosity, and good that they they found it, not somebody else. Uh, scientists at MIT C-Sale developed what they call a Pac-Man attack uh, on Apple M1 systems on chip that can find correct values to pass the check. So first there would need to be a successful vulnerability on the software side that would otherwise be stopped by PAC. If you don't have that, this attack doesn't work. You've got to have that vulnerability. Then the attack uses a speculative execution attack. These are pretty common now. Uh, if you've heard of Spectre and Meltdown attacks on the x86 instruction set, this is a similar type of attack on ARM. Speculative execution tries to anticipate tasks before they're called for in order to speed up processing. So speculative execution is a good thing. That's what the processor is using to speed up its, its work. Speculative execution attacks can read patterns in how the processor anticipates those tasks and then deduce data from that through a side channel. The MIT scientists conducted a speculative execution attack and then judged whether they had guessed the correct pack value or not through the side channel. Because there are so many possible, only so many possibilities for a pack value, they just kept guessing until they got the right one. And then they were able to get past the pack defense and let the vulnerability happen. So the Pac Man attack requires physical access to the machine. Uh, you're not going to be able to do that speculative execution attack over software, uh, not remotely anyway. That's the good news and the bad news. On the one hand, it's harder to pull off. On the other hand, it also means it cannot be patched. So the question you're probably asking is, how bad is this? Should I throw away my Apple laptop, Sarah? <laughs> No, I mean, unless you have some other beef with it, don't throw away your laptop or don't get angry at uh, Apple in, 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 in the same situation because the attacks work against any ARM chip that is implemented pack, including chips from Qualcomm and Samsung. So it's not just an Apple issue. The attack wouldn't be necessary against chips that don't um, implement pack as those chips don't have that protection. But pack also doesn't bypass all security on the M1. Only bugs that otherwise would only be stopped by pack checks. Because of that, Apple told TechCrunch that it had concluded this issue does not pose any immediate risk to our users and is insufficient to bypass operating system security protections on its own. The forthcoming M2 has not been tested for the flaw. I'm sure it will be, but, you know, as of right now, still, you know, jury's out. The scientists who discovered the attack will present findings on June 18th at the International Symposium on Computer Architecture. Yeah, and we'll probably get a, a few more details about this. Uh, you know, David, you're, you're right there in the security space these days. How does this make you feel? Uh, honestly, I'm not a Mac user, so I'm not as concerned. <laughs> but you might be a Qualcomm user. You might be a, a Samsung user, right? Yes, it was. I, you know... Look, vulnerabilities, they're, if you just got to calculate what how it's attacking your environment. I mean, speaking of vulnerabilities in general, um, one uh, the from uh, Kenneth Security, they're a big vulnerability security company, and they had calculated like 60% of all vulnerabilities you can flat out ignore. So, I mean, every company is dealing with thousands. You really need to understand how this impacts your environment. So... For me, it's not really impacting my environment, but for someone else, it could be monstrous. And so the answer to how do you feel is, how is this connecting to your environment? Yeah, right. If, if you are a high value target, uh, and and you might be in a situation where you'd have to hand your laptop over to somebody or your laptop might be out of your control. Maybe you leave it in a hotel room or something. Uh, you might need to think about this. You might need mm -hmm. to think about the fact and you'll be very curious on June 18th to find out, OK, physical access. But how long do they have to have physical access? Does it require soldering? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and. And most of us are not going to be in that situation. And the other thing that Apple's saying is, 
we're also trying to protect you from these vulnerabilities in the operating system. It's not like the M1 was the main defense against these vulnerabilities. We're, we're hoping to shut down all these kinds of memory attacks that you would need in the first place before they ever get to the processor. This was just the safety of last resort. So the, it, it essentially sets the, the security on an Apple back to where it was before PAC was implemented in the ARM chipset, which it isn't always implemented on a lot of chips already. Uh, so, so yes, it's it's a good thing they discovered it. Hopefully they get it fixed in the M2. I don't think it's devastating for 99% of M1 users. What you should be more concerned about in talking about physical access is when you hand your phone over to one of those fix-it companies to put a new screen on. For you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you make sure that you're, you're super trustworthy, that they're not going to go in and do something but there's all kinds of other things they could do in that situation more than this this might not be the one that they they try to use yes, i know what i'm just saying we didn't you didn't need this for them to cause yeah exactly no that's a very good essentially point. if someone's having physical access to your machine that's um it's a whole different ball game that's a whole yeah. different ball game yeah, yeah. that's, that's hey. concern one if you uh, if you have other thoughts on this, if if you've uh, if you're a high value target and you're like, yeah, this affects me, uh, give us an email. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Send us along a note. WWDC was not the only tech conference going on this week. The IT security focused RSA conference ended Thursday. David attended the event and uh, as has become tradition on Daily Tech News Show, has showed up to talk to us about some of the trends you Honestly, noticed. Honestly, I think this was my 10th RSA and I may, this might be actually close to 10 appearances with you. It, it could be. Like, it, I, I think you've done it pretty much long. every year we've done the show. Yeah. Yeah. I've come many, many, many times. Um, so, I will always precursor this with the show is enormous. There's no conceivable way I can see all of it. So this is Dave's review from from what yeah. I saw, what my eyeballs and, and ears could see and hear. Because it's, uh, and this is, by the way, these are just views of the show floor, which was plenty packed. It wasn't the volume of people. I think the volume was probably half, about 20,000 people. They, I, they've had like 42,000, I think was back in uh, 2020, at the beginning of 2020. Um, but I will show, say that in terms of uh, booth sponsors, there it was a completely packed. They sold essentially every spot on the floor to cybersecurity companies. And the thing that's amazing for those of you not in the world, that world only is growing with new competitor, essentially new players in the marketplace. And that again, these are just numbers I've heard. I in the early days I had heard three thousand, four thousand. Then I was hearing five thousand companies. Now I've heard as high as six thousand. Who the friggin' No, and is. and real quick, uh, uh, this happens in San Francisco, correct? I mean, every, what, what every was the what did the venue year. look like this year? Well, the venue is enormous now. So, for those of you who've ever been to the Moscone Conference Center, there used to be a North Hall and a South Hall for all the booths, but there's been such a demand uh, that the Moscone Center actually did a major conversion, and there is no North and South Hall. It's just one giant hall because they connected the two, and so there's like pretty much now they added another 50% more space, if not even more for boost. So it's just, uh, it's overwhelming. Uh, it, it's just an enormous, mar enormous marketplace period, cybersecurity. And most consumers don't know it because they're, they're not selling to consumers. They're just vendors selling to other businesses to secure their environments. All right. So, so obviously one of the trends is uh, you keep hearing about all these vulnerabilities, folks. Guess what? That means security is booming. There, there's booming. more companies needed than ever. It, does it feel like companies are, more, are taking it seriously? To come in. This is the thing is that, you know, there were days that like, you know, you only needed like firewall and some like uh, identity management type thing. But now there's all these new vectors. Oh, oh, no, there's, you know, there's IoT, Internet of Things. And we need to secure that environment, too. And, oh, now we also have cloud. We now have to secure that environment. Oh, but there's many vectors of cloud. And there's the issue of how are you configuring your cloud? Well, you need a security program to handle that as well. And oh, are you multi-cloud? Well, you need to have security to manage, manage your multi-cloud. Like, the, the number of vectors, it's endless. And then Gartner, the research firm, keeps coming up with a new category. There was one called, that came out a while ago. I don't know if Gartner didn't coin it, but called XDR. Actually, I think it was Palo Alto Networks that coined it. And nobody was really glomming on. But at this year, the show XDR, which is the next generation of what EDR, which stands for Endpoint Detection, um, CrowdStrike, probably the biggest player in that space. XDR is kind of the next level of uh, how do I 
detect on the endpoint, but how do I connect it to all the other knowledge I have in my environment to tell the story of what the heck's going on? And it also includes my cloud endpoints as well. So it's um, more, there's more acronyms to learn, more categories, more confusion. It's overwhelming. D what's the messaging around security? Uh, what, what was the tone that you felt? The tone, I, I think the tone is a lot, lot less negative, even though, even though it's such a horrible situation we're all kind of dealing with and nobody's wrapped their arms around it by any stretch. There is this, A, there's a need to be more positive about cybersecurity in that, you know, we can win, we can beat, you know, it is a manageable thing to a degree. It's, you know, there is no such thing as 100% security for that matter. Sure. Uh, but mostly the reason for the positive messaging is actually to get more staff in the industry. Um, if you keep talking about it being scary, people are not going to work in this industry. And the good news is it's a very lucrative industry if you can get in, into it. Uh, the demand is high. Every single CISO, uh, essentially chief information security offer that I speak to, is hiring. Everyone's hiring. You know, the, you know, it's the big joke we have on our show. You know, I always ask, you know, are you hiring? And rarely does someone say no. You talked last time you were here about uh, the hiring practice gap between, you know, the, the people who want the jobs and this, the experience that they, they require. Uh, was that pretty much the, the same at RSA or, or well, did you see any improvement same. there? But there's there's a one of the big issues to solve the gap issue is is training. And then you know that you probably have heard the classic line of, well, I don't I'm fearing if I train the people and they leave, then I've wasted the money on this training. But it's kind of such a kind of an incestuous group that people do bounce from one to the next and they will come back and they will refer you. So actually the reverse is true. If you don't train them, they're going to leave because people coming into this industry want to move up. They want to be trained. And if training is not part of your uh, organization's culture, then A, they don't want to join. And if they find out, they're going to leave because everyone wants new skills and they want to move up. Uh, nobody comes into this level, you know, into this industry to stay at the green level and just stay there. I feel like as consumers, we often hear the story of this company didn't spend the time and resources it should have, and then it got breached, and now the damage is worse than if they had prepared. RSA is the one of the places where these companies have the opportunity, you know, to strike the deals, spend the money, get the resources. Do you, it is do you a get fire any sense that that's getting better? It's a fire hose of information. Often what, what forces companies to get there is actually not the stories of, oh, this company got breached, that company got breached. Yes, they do want to beef up their security, but it's honestly, it's regulations. And now the Security and Exchange Commi Commissions, the SEC, um, has proposed new rulings forcing public companies to disclose what their security posture is. Now, again, it's just a proposal and it's going through a lot of debate right now, but you realize this, you know, the SEC has rules that you have to disclose your financials. You got to disclose other things. One of the things they don't have is disclosing, you know, what your security posture is. And um, this is quite important too. And also if you have insurance too, and we were talking about this a lot, cyber insurance is also a much bigger story mm -hmm. now too. And more and more companies are getting rejected for cyber insurance. You know, we're talking 30 to 40% of companies that apply for cyber insurance get rejected because they don't have the security controls in place. So they realize, well, if I want this, I have to get to this level. So mm -hmm. it's it's often not the fear that's forcing the, the sort of the rapid movement, but rather if I don't do this, I can't get insurance. If I don't do this, I'm going to get fined. So there's an immediate, very visible danger in front of them that will for sure happen. And it's not an attack. Yeah, once you focus the CFO's mind, yeah. <laughs> suddenly suddenly things start to happen. All right, uh, let's check out the mailbag before we get out of here. Let's do it. Rob, who lives in Germany, writes, um, and this is in response to our FIDO conversation from the other day. Rob says, one issue I see with FIDO, at least in my smallest group of people, is what if you can't have your phone with you? I work for the U.S. military, and there are many of us who work in areas where no personal wireless devices are allowed. Phones wireless headphones, smartwatches, even air tags and tile devices are a no-go where I work. Maybe I'm missing something, but 
is there another alternative? Good news, Rob. Uh, while we usually use a phone as an example, uh, since almost everyone has one, there are alternatives to using your phone with FIDO2. Uh, one example I pulled off of Army.mil, the U.S. Army's page, uh, reading about multi-factor authentication that a fast identity online or FIDO certified cryptographic USB hardware token uh, is a, an acceptable uh, way to you do logins on on army computers. So uh, so there are alternatives beyond the phone. And then there are, there are ways to use secure phones as your login instead of your personal phone, stuff like that. Uh, and, and sometimes those kinds of accommodations are made. But yes, FIDO is actually uh, being taken up by military organizations uh, as, as well as private organizations. I imagine FIDO was a big topic of conversation at RSA too, right, David? Uh, yeah, well, passwordless is 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 been a hot, like what you were describing. Passwords are an antiquated um, element of the internet. They were never. It's uh, ironic. They were designed for some level of security, but they were never designed to be secure to start with, which is uh, is bizarre. I find. Yeah. Um, but there has been this long drive to get off a of password or move to multi-factor authentication where MFA is really literally putting a Band-Aid on a bad process. Um, but we, and we talk about this all the time, that if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do one thing to beef up your security, or actually two things, one is always MFA, and that will greatly, greatly reduce the potential for account takeover. That's multi-factor authentication, not yeah, so a master yes, in multi, fine arts. But multi-factor, yeah, yeah, not master of fine arts. Um, Why not both? Yeah, <laughs> if you have both, it's great. It can be both. <laughs> and then the second thing is getting a, a password manager. But if you go, if you don't have to use a password manager, it's great. But That's it's interesting. Funny. LastPass, one of the biggest password managers, is the one who's you know pushing the um, yeah yeah the passwordless model. Uh, and then in response to uh, Justin and I kind of discussing whether Xbox cloud gaming is the mushy middle, which Justin thought or or, or I thought like a, a pretty advantageous thing for a lot of folks who just don't want to have to use a console or a PC. Uh, Josh Grisdale wrote us a nice note uh, saying that he, he loves living in the mushy middle. And Andrew wrote, I am the exact target demographic for all these cloud gaming advances. I'm a lifetime gamer, even scrimping and saving for new consoles in college. But his marriage, career, vacation, etc. have taken priority. $300 plus gaming consoles that I get to use for less than 10 hours a week have dropped off the budget priority list. But a monthly Xbox Game Pass subscription fits in nicely now that my PC can't run WoW anymore. I imagine there are a good number of folks like me who used to game more frequently and would like the option to check out modern titles without needing to outlay so much money. The all-you-can-play model also works well for the times that you learn quickly that a certain type of game isn't for you. Uh, well said, Andrew. Thank you for that. Yeah, and thanks to everybody who sends us feedback, questions, comments, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Keep them coming. I want good stuff over this I, weekend. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug for, for the two of you because we love feedback, and I don't think the audience knows how much you like that, how much your show is based on it because ours is like that. So I'm plugging for them. Give them more feedback. Yeah, don't be. If you're like, oh, they don't want to hear from me, you're wrong. We do. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do yes, want, we do. You do want to hear from them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, we wanted to hear from Len Peralta, but uh, he couldn't refuse his son being in a rap competition. Uh, so he had to go do that instead of being on the show, which I almost would rather be there myself. If this show wasn't so fun, I'd be like, I, I, I don't know. Like, is it a Twitch stream? Rap I mean, what are we all doing yeah. right now? <laughs> but Len, being the consummate professional that he is, still drew us something for today's show. It's called Pac-Man Attack. And of course, <laughs> as you might imagine, it's Pac-Man uh, going after the M1 chip uh, to eat it up. Uh, we're talking, of course, about the video game Pac-Man in this case. Uh, if you'd like that print, uh, Len has it available at lenperaltastore.com. Uh, and if you're a patron of his, you might have it already. Patreon.com slash Len. David Spark, always good to have you on the show. Great stuff as always. Um, hope you had fun at RSA this week. Let folks know where they can keep up with your wrap-ups from the show and everything else that you do. Yeah, just go to CISOseries.com, C-I-S-O, series.com. And actually, if you look right there at the top of the page right there, uh, there's that little black icon that says the finals uh, of um, of the uh, Captured CISO, right there where your cursor is. Yeah, that. If you click on that, um, we had, have a new show, and our finals are coming up a week from today. So please join us. It'll actually be before the show, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. So join us for that. 
before Good Day Internet. Perfect. Perfect uh, lead in. Thank you for that. Exactly. I like that. We also have three new bosses to thank going into the weekend strong. We got Paul, we got Matt, and we got Mark. All just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you to our new bosses, Paul, Matt, and Mark. Ah, the gospel of Patreon. Uh, thank you to all Gotta three love it. Yeah. It's a strong Friday. Let's yeah. keep it going on Monday, Good everybody. Stuff, y'all. Thank Don't you let for us that. down. <laughs> Just a reminder, there is a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. Rolls right after DTNS wraps up. Patreon.com slash DTNS is where you can find out more about that. Just a reminder, we do the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Hope you all have a great weekend. We'll be back on Monday with Lamar Wilson joining us. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, WS Goddess One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Gadget Virtuoso, Steve Guadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Contributors for this week's show included Nika Monford, Terrence Gaines, Scott Johnson, and Justin Robert Young. Our guest this week was David Spark. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>